Driven. Hello, everyone. This is a data driven chat, and today my guest is Glenn Perry. Uh, I know Glenn for many years now. I, I don't know how many years exactly, but Glenn is a professor in digital transformation at uh, the University of Surrey. Uh, he works on a lot of cool projects. Uh, he's also working at the Center of Digital Economy at the University of Surrey. And uh, besides being a, um, an expert in digital transformation and artificial intelligence, Glenn is also an expert in business models. So today we're going to talk about um, data-driven business models, artificial intelligence, and digital transformation. Hi, Glenn. It's Hi, great to have you here. <laughs> Uh, thanks a lot for finding the time. So uh, to kick off our discussion, can you tell us how did you become interested in digital transformation and artificial intelligence? Oh, right. Okay, the big questions. So um, many years ago, I started, I was working in aerospace um, and we were working on lean transformation. And we started the Journal of Enterprise Transformation. That was with colleagues from MIT, Debbie Nightingale, Ricardo Valerdi. Um, and we were looking at big changes. And, and some of those big changes were coming from digital technologies like ERP. So I, I, I did some work on ERP implementations. And we were looking at what, what does transformation mean? And, you know, it, it's this... A response to we we actually defined it. We had the the Journal of Enterprise Transformation, and we defined transformation as a response to a change in the environment. It's a fundamental alteration in your context, and it's a step change in your performance that's sustained through a business cycle. So, so we sort of understood what transformation is, and you know the digital stuff with the enterprise resource planning ERP systems like SAP R three. I did a lot of work about implementation of those systems. And I, I did a really in, interesting interview um, with, um, I'm trying to remember the name, is it built on the, the big Australian uh, mining company? Mm -hmm. And the, the boss of that said, um, ERP is not a tool for the business. ERP is the business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa. That's, uh, you know, this guy run a mining firm and he's basically telling me that the digital system is the business. So I wrote a book, ERP, Implementation and Maintenance. Um, and that was the quote at the start of the book. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were working, you know, a lot in that space in uh, services um, because, you know, Rolls-Royce were moving to a service business. And we could see that, you know, they got this power by the hour and they'd really instrumented the engine. So a lot of sensors that was sort of before it was called Internet of Things, they were just sensors that were digital. And um, wind chill, I don't know if you remember that, the sort of the, the big software systems that were on, on military ships with all the sensors. Uh, and so all of that world was going digital, and it was really interesting. And I, I then, I was actually in, in London being, being swanky, having drinks in Mayfair, and a friend had just taken over as head of um, global vice president for EMI, the music firm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and he was explaining um, that the music industry was losing loads of money, um, six, 600 600,000 or 600 million, and it was loads. It was just a massive decline in revenue that they were seeing. And he said, yeah, all the music, they, they got this good physical supply chain, which was DVDs and records and tapes, less so, but, you know, it's the, um, CDs, or, you know, physical products. Mm -hmm. And they really controlled, they controlled the manufacturer, they controlled the supply. So they decided, you know, what went out, what was out at all times. And then piracy came along and the music went digital. And so... I, I was lucky that working working with with music industry, they gave us access to all this data, because the one thing they had was loads and loads of data, and they were quite open. and, and Obviously, I, I was able to work with some great analysts, and we wrote about fifteen academic papers, um, and we were following the early days of the mu move from physical to digital in music, and I, I was just really fascinated by that. And, you know, we lived through that change, um, had good access to data. This was before streaming even. And, and we could see how the business models evolved, how people started to understand value. 
And I think it, it's maybe something that it's not appreciated at the moment, but quite how how good the media firms have been in turning around what was a potential disaster for the industry into this really exciting and dynamic um industry that we see now we have all this content and you can access whatever you like whenever you like and all those business models and you know the ai that's working in the background to give you good recommendations uh, and what you don't see is is the information that's going back to corporate to say look this show is really popular uh, whereas before it might have been somebody's opinion some taste maker and mm-hmm. um, now you've got real data saying look this is what people like and that you know generates the revenue but then they can also still be creative and we see this interesting dynamic between the creatives and the data scientists which i I know in your work you're really really familiar with but that that dialogue is really rich and vibrant and it leads us to so many great shows so i mean we're on the so Glenn, yeah, you have you, uh, no, it's okay. Uh, so you have a you have a PhD from University of Cambridge. Uh, is that in engineering? Uh, I, uh, engineering, right? Yeah, I am. I was actually a material scientist. Material scientist. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, like uh, uh, so, a lot of people who listen to this podcast, they're kind of trying to get into artificial intelligence uh, or data science. Uh, they're interested in various ex- aspects of it, and we had some people on this podcast who ca- kind of came from uh, from business into data science. But you seem to have started from like very very data driven <laughs> um, <laughs> data driven area, and you moved into business mode. So um, just to kind of expand on what you said, uh, does this experience in material science help you in designing, um, you know, business model innovation, thinking about value, thinking about digital transformation? Does that actually help having like this technical knowledge? Um, I think so. I mean, my my original degree was chemistry with business. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So I was a a chemist and then I I became, I made paint. Um, I worked for British Steel for a couple of years. I made paint and I did electrochemistry. And electrochemistry is sort of linking this weird physical world of chemistry into the sort of digital space. And I I used to get my soldering iron and I used to make uh, um, equivalent circuits. and, And so you're translating what's happening physically into a digital signal. And then I went and did my PhD, which was really, um, looking at nano composites. So I was fairly empirically driven, but chemistry is, and there's a great quote, it's the it's the most exacting of, of sciences and the most interesting and, and the darkest of arts because chemistry is a real dark art because we say such stuff is, you know, water's H2O. We know it's not. <laughs> it, it's just an approximation. So chemists, I guess we're, we're quite happy with ambiguity. Yeah, I think a knowing... lot of people are now thinking about the Breaking Bad. <laughs> they think about <laughs> chemists, chemists as dark arts <laughs> scientists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, yeah. but it is it is very data driven, right? You you need to do a lot of testing and. Um, um, yeah, I guess um, understanding how you know um, how you can you can work through this testing probably helps when you are doing testing in business, you know, in in, in business environment and business models. But I mean, uh, this is a cool degree, chemistry with with business. It's uh, uh, <laughs> it gives you a lot of <laughs> a lot of options, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a lot of fun. Um... And yeah, because in in business, you know, whatever you do, I, I you know, I, I really enjoyed my chemistry and I, I like to think I was pretty good at it. Um, but what I found was you were immediately, you know, you get good at something like that. And then they say, great, we want you to manage your portfolio. And then you're in charge of the maths, the numbers, the money. And I didn't know what revenue and margin and, and things were. But when you combine those two, you know, if, if, if you're a good engineer or whatever, you're going to end up managing a team and the budget. So it's that complementarity, I think, super important. Mm-hmm. 
So uh, for those uh, for those uh, people who do not know your work, I mean, they will know after <laughs> after <laughs> this podcast because uh, you know I will provide links to to your projects and to your website. And uh, Glenn has a Wikipedia page as well, so you know you can actually read uh, um, uh, things about Glenn uh, in you know from Wikipedia. And uh, yeah, so can you give us an example of a recent project that you have done and uh, tell us about what you learned? from this project uh, just as a taster of what you do oh um well i've got a number of projects yeah yeah i know I, I know but i mean <laughs> tell us about one or a couple yeah okay so well the one the paper i've just published i suppose that's that's always the thing that's front of mind is is the blockchain case studies in food supply chain visibility uh, and this was, you know, looking at the application of blockchain technology. And, you, you know, the thing with it is it's, it's an interesting technology that has been massively overhyped and is probably used inappropriately quite a lot. And I was really interested in, well, where does this tech actually find a, a, a solid use, a proper use? And, you know, working with a, a team of some great people, we looked at, how uh, World Wildlife Fund and Transceivable are applying it to, to try and provide some security around fishing and, you know, trying to address um, modern day slavery because that's a problem on, on these um, fishing vessels. We looked at wine tracing because when you're shipping wine across the world, there's actually a lot of fraud in expensive wine. And we looked at grain. So when people are claiming that, that the, you know, the product is um, organic, how do you make sure that that supply chain, you know, it's not been diluted somehow, that it genuinely is an organic product? And also baby food, there was a problem with, with um, contamination of baby food in China. And so we're looking at what do you do to the physical product? How are these companies doing it? So they're using things like RFID, radio frequency tags on the physical product that link it in the digital world. And then they're writing it into the blockchain, some unique aspects, you know, with the, the baby food, they take a photograph with your canister and there's the RFID tag on it. And if you try and open it or tamper with it, it breaks the tag. So you sever that digital link. Um, and then if you scan it, you can get a picture of what this thing should look like. Um, uh, and we were showing in, in that particular paper, it's in the uh, Supply Chain Management and International Journal. Um, we were we were looking at how this technology really helps that supply chain. Uh, one of the things I liked about that piece of work was the companies we spoke to were prepared to tell us where their technology was weak. And most firms, you know, it's all good, but they were really prepared to have that dialogue with us. And I think that was for me was that real learning was wow, you know, these are innovative, smart people who who are prepared to talk about the problems. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, when you talk about the problems, that's where you learn more. And it's this physical to digital interface that's problematic. And we see that in, in all our different projects. Yeah. Um, yeah, you just reminded me, you just reminded me of Brenna Brown. I'm, I'm a big fan of her. And, uh, um, you know, the, the talk, the, she's, she's got the stat talk on vulnerability. And she says, well, when you ask people to give examples of, uh, you know, go, of something good, <laughs> they normally tell you about problems. So, <laughs> so I guess, I guess that's kind of similar in the business world, right? When you, when you're trying to, to, to talk about, oh, you know, what, uh, what is the next frontier of automation or artificial intelligence in your company? And people tell you about how they struggle with it so is that is that something that you see a lot in your in your work it, it, to be honest it, it's one of those it depends who you talk to blockchains mm -hmm. an interesting world because there's a lot of hype mm -hmm. and some people you know whatever you say they they're like no blockchain's amazing and it is amazing but it's it's just got a reputation beyond what it can do mm -hmm. uh, and so I think, you know, that, that, that classic trends, that change curve, you know, we're in this depths of despair. People have lost, lost hope in it. But actually, some of the things that it can do and the good engineers that we get to talk to are starting to develop some really, if you like, proper applications and the good engineers going, right, this is, it's really good at tracking. And, yeah, these are the weaknesses, but it's, it's better than what we do before. And I think that's, you know, that's when you start to have a sensible conversation. And for things like import-export, 
um, you know, where you've got a document that can't change easily, that's actually what you want. And if you can automate that, then moving goods around the world, there's a great application for blockchain there with this sort of immutable, when you don't really trust some people, that, that's a great application of that technology. I don't know if you um, uh, uh, what you found in in uh, I haven't read the paper yet. I will, uh, I promise. And uh, um, the link uh, to the paper will be uh, under this video. So if you guys uh, listening to this podcast and want to read the paper, the link is uh, just under the video. And um, yeah, so I, I, I'm just wondering. You, you mentioned the hype around blockchains, and um, mm -hmm. um, uh, the question that I had for you is: uh, I don't know whether you want to go there, but uh, the question. Question is, uh, do you think um, uh, how, how many companies you talk to just you know just say they do <laughs> blockchain, and how many actually do blockchain? Because I, like in my experience, uh, I feel that a lot of a lot of companies say, oh, you know, we have these plans to implement blockchain, but very very few actually you know have the technology to do it. Is that is that uh, am I yeah you know I, I haven't I actually haven't looked at it for quite some time so maybe i'm uh, uh my, my my view is outdated so what what uh, what what's your uh, take on this no you're absolutely right as always um <laughs> in, in the paper we actually give you the numbers of how many firms we approached and i think i think we even say how many of them we discover when we do these you know start to engage with them they haven't got a blockchain mm -hmm. uh, we found firms who had paid for a blockchain and really didn't need it. You're like, well, you don't need it. You know, a database would be fine. It would work better. And they would say, yeah, but, you know, we, we just wanted to be able to say we had this technology because then our customers would be impressed. And you're like, oh, really? <laughs> you overcomplicated and added expense in when it really wasn't needed. And I think, you know, that's, that's part of the problem with that particular technology. I, I sort of described blockchain as a squirrel. You know, most most technology is sort of like a rat. Mm. People ignore it, hope it's underground and don't notice it. Whereas, whereas blockchain's like a squirrel. It's got this bushy tail and people go, oh, isn't it cute? No, it's just another rat. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, you're attracted to it. Yeah, it's a glorified <laughs> rat, I guess. <laughs> exactly. I, I, yeah, I don't want us to kind of to stop uh, just on blockchain because I know you do a lot <laughs> of other things apart from blockchain. So... Um, uh, this is a difficult question, but um, if you had to pick one thing you're particularly proud of uh, that you have done in your career so far, what would it be? And you can't say it's in the future, you know, it's what I'm doing, <laughs> what I'm doing next. So, yeah, so basically out of kind of the projects that you have done so far, or it um, does not necessarily have to be a project, something that you, you know, you think is the, the kind of the big achievement in your career, what would you pick? I suppose from a project perspective, I mean, the work we 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 started together with uh, the hub of all things, you know, that I think that's quite interesting because of where it goes, you know, looking at, at what I think going into the future will be a, a bigger battle. And this is around personal data and privacy and owning your own data. And, you know, we, we kicked that off together however many years ago. Yeah, 20, actually, 2013 is when I joined, but you guys were there before. Yeah, so I just wanted to explain for people who do not know uh, Hub of All Things Project. I think it's now called Data Swift. Is that is that the next evolution yeah, of it? Yeah. yeah, so the idea of the project uh, in kind of in a very basic way, I'm sure Glenn can explain it a lot better than me, but uh, the idea is that, you know, currently we kind of, um, donate our valuable personal data to big corp corporations for free. And this project was kind of um, looking at empowering people to use their personal data uh, to trade, you know, to directly trade um, in a, a yeah, multi, yeah, uh, yeah, basically, yeah, multi-level markets uh, with other companies and uh, entities and really appreciate the value of, of personal data that we have. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's about that's right. It's it's about giving the individual control over their data. So instead of you know when you sign up to Facebook, they then hold your data in a centralized big database. But actually, you could have a distributed database where you, the individual, hold your data, and sort of the processing is done in your space, and only the results go out, and you share what you like. So you sort of flip the model. 
Um, so that's that's what Hub of All Things and Data Swift and the various EPSRC funded projects we're doing. It's all about that. But actually, <laughs> reflecting on your question, yeah, you know, the work, that's a, a thing. But I suppose the most important thing I've done, I think, is I trained as a psychotherapist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that must be, uh, that must come handy uh, at various points. Uh, especially now that you know we are concerned about well-being, and uh, yeah, I guess it helps with uh, a lot of things, you know, managing yeah. relationships with co-workers and students. <laughs> well, I think yeah. I mean, you know, I was fairly empirically driven. I, I, you know, I wasn't desperately emotionally aware, and when I went through you know training and learning about psychotherapy, you know, I think that made me. Hopefully, I was, I was Rogerian personal centered therapist, if, if anyone knows what that means. But um, it makes you listen and value other people and recognize that, you know, you need to try and be more authentic in your relationships with others. And also, I recognize that I'm not very smart. And in 10 years time, I will look back at me now and I will be smarter. <laughs> And if you can sort of hold those things when you're working, especially in the you know in the academic world where um, people are often very smart, very driven by the idea, but it's a very emotional world, really. And I, I think you know that's probably the most important thing I've done. And when you're managing a PhD student, working with them, you know that's a long relationship, and and having that emotional awareness. I mean, it helps you support them, but also it helps, I was going to say it helps me remain sane, but I think that would be questionable. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I think I think you're being modest there uh, on on a lot of things, but yeah, I mean, I think I think that's uh, that's a cool skill to have, you know, and a cool training to have. Uh, that uh, I I definitely do not have a lot of patience sometimes <laughs> with my students, <laughs> so I I wish you know I had some training and as a as a psychotherapist, I think it would have helped. So um um. To kind of expand on 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 what uh, on on our discussion around um, business models and digital transformation. So, uh, so if we look at the data science and artificial intelligence projects in general um, from a value perspective, so um, um, and you have done a lot of research on this. So, how can basically companies uh, assess the value of a particular data science or automation or AI project? Uh, in other words, how can a company um, make a decision about whether it's worth <laughs> to use data science or AI or automation to solve a particular problem? Um, okay, so I always go back and say, you've got to look at customer value. Mm -hmm. And it, it's that relentless focus on customer value. What is valuable to the customer for the customer? How are they integrating your offer into their world? So what are they doing with it? And this is, you know, the, the, the a great example I always give my students is think about a chair. And what do you do with your chair? Yeah, you sit on it. Mm -hmm. But if you if you were phenomenological and you watched and you just sat and watched people with a chair, you'll very soon notice people hang their coats over the back of a chair. And yet very few chairs are designed to keep your jacket looking nice. I mean, this is a, a you know, a Paul Smith nice leather jacket mm -hmm. uh, that I'm wearing right now. It's very soft. And I do not want it destroyed by or sort of twisted out of shape by unpleasant chairs <laughs> mm -hmm. so why don't chairs have hangers across the back so this is this is really understanding customer value what are people gonna do with whatever the outcome of your ai is mm -hmm. because if you can solve people's problems then you can then step back and say do your value stream map right? This is the this is the value proposition that I'm I'm going with. Maybe do some testing, see what people do with it, and and then you know apply your lean principles. Let's look at our process. What are we doing? How do we generate that? How do we take all the waste out so we can deliver that more quickly to the customer? And then also there was some lovely work got many years ago, twenty years ago, on spiral design. 
can we get it to our customer quickly, let them play with it and break it, and then you know see what they really want to do with it, see how they use it, and then iterate it again and iterate it again. And I think AI offers you some great opportunities. Um, you know, where you can learn rapidly. I mean, the work we did together on that that movies paper mm -hmm. was really nice because you know that 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 movies paper showed that you can you can look at films and and people I've discussed it with say you know can we get feedback to authors so they can iterate they can make better stories and I think that's really great. Um, but it, it's about that customer value, and it's you know where do we use it? Where does it really add value? And the other thing is I'd say don't be afraid to play. The great leaders, the, you know, the senior manager I've spoken with are prepared to take sort of big data blocks and, and give it to, you know, people like you and I and say, right, play with that. Come back and tell us what you can find. And don't, you know, real sort of skunk work stuff. Don't come with an agenda to tell good data scientists what to do. Give them data, tell them to play. It's low cost. And then when they come back and say, we did these cool things. So, right. Those are cool things, and this bit of those cool things could make us some money because that's where the, the sort of the management comes in, that ability to spot the opportunity. So it's that relentless focus on customer value, understand the pain points of the customer, let those great scientists who are really creative do that, uh, and then I think you can really, you know, that, that old-fashioned lean thinking, it's old-fashioned, it's 20 years old, but, you know, that that linking that with the creativity and some of the incredible things that you know the young people we get to work with can do that's when you really make the breakthroughs and i think that's where you can you can do it at low cost much lower cost than people think and you can do much much cooler things much more quickly than you think if you're prepared to work in that way yeah i just want to i just want to explain to, to uh, people who will listen to this podcast uh, that uh, glenn and i we have uh, with other people with marco and uh, and alex we wrote a paper on movies and uh, how you can use emotional arcs in movies to predict revenue so predict actually how how successful the movies are, are going to be financially um so uh, yeah i think uh, the paper now has what is it 26,000 downloads <laughs> as a result of COVID. <laughs> I think we had uh, like trouble publishing it, right? But then uh, ultimately um, it, uh, you know, we, we published it in a good journal and uh, all of a sudden, like as soon as we were on quarantine, I guess many people started to look into how to make, <laughs> how to make videos. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I will, I will also uh, uh, provide the link again underneath this video if you want to read this paper. Um, yeah, so you can you can do that. So, uh, Glenn, so can you give us? So you 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 uh, we discussed kind of in in general the you know that uh, you need to think about the customer, and uh, that's kind of the top top priority in the you know automation AI data science strategy for the company. But can can you give us uh, some examples of good and bad data science business models? Um, maybe um, maybe something that you came across during your research. The the good, I think, I'd have to go back to the music industry, mm -hmm. um, and you know, they if you like, they they were right at the forefront of taking the pain on the digital transformation. You know, with with Napster, for those of a certain age, we were even. I guess the young people might not even know who Napster is, but they were the early pr um, piracy site that basically made all music free. And it was huge back in sort of 98, 99. So you went from having to pay, um, I don't know, 15, 20 pounds for an album, if you could get it. And all of a sudden, all the music from whenever was freely available. and. Um, there was massive piracy. The industry just tanked because nobody was buying. Everything was being being copied and shared freely, and it could have really been bad for the the whole industry. And yet, they used great AI. They used great people, good analytics, understood what's going on, developed new business models. And now, if you look at the music industry and the diversity. Of what you know, what's out there. There's more genres, and the way we listen, you know, it's gone beyond genre because they actually using AI, they can break apart the beat structure, and they can see that 
you know, this this particular modern pop music that you like is very similar to this traditional jazz. So if you like that, you'll probably like this. And and these connections are being made. You know, some uh, heavy metal, for instance, might have resonance to certain classical musical pieces because they have similar chord structures. And you're like, well, if you like that, you'll probably like this. And this goes beyond the old fashioned genre of pop and rock and, and whatever. It really, the AI can break it down. Uh, and the other thing that's gone uh, with the music is, is chronology, because it used to be that you it was a weekly thing, and what's hot this week, what's hot next week. Obviously, that still exists. There's new music coming out, but now you can reach back into the past, and and the AI can can reach back. You know, I, I'm I'm quite into blues and things like that, and it it'll say, well, have you listened to Big Bill Brunsey? Have you listened to you know these artists from way back when? Oh, and you know Albert Collins from the eighties and the very latest artists who are also using similar chord structures and to really engage you i think you know the music industry are are using amazing data analysis and also to support new bands new acts they can test them they've got great models and um, people often don't appreciate quite what a difficult industry it is because often you've got uh, young people who are in little groups doing amazing things and you're going to give them quarter of a million pounds to make an album that's a real bet and the amount of analysis that they do before they give you know 18 year olds who drink too much a load of money to make some music that's an interesting business to be in and people don't appreciate quite how much risk there is so there's a lot of data analysis and we've ended up with this really rich um media uh landscape that we see in music now so i think that's a, a real success in terms of ai and digital business yeah so um uh, obviously you know we last year in 20 2019 2018 i guess we all were very very excited about um, industrial revolution for zero and uh, you know automation and ai but uh, this year we had uh, an extraordinary event, uh, uh, COVID-19, mm -hmm. right? So the coronavirus. So, and, and there are a lot of jokes about this uh, in, in, in various media that, you know, like we all thought that uh, digital revolution will, will change the world. Now we know COVID will change the world. So, yeah, I guess um, uh, what, I'm, what I'm wondering about, uh, how did the landscape uh, of digital transformation changed with COVID? Is that, do you see it as an accelerator or is it an inhibitor? Um, what's your take on this? Okay, I, I, I think there'll be two things from, you know, a positive and negative. The positive, we've definitely seen an acceleration to online in ways that, you know, we, as academics, we're, we're much more online than, than some of our, our other business counterparts. Uh, we, you know, we're, I think, you know, in our, our world, we work pretty much anywhere from a laptop. Um, and that's how we work. We work in teams, have done for years, integrating multiple sectors. We work from um, home a lot. <laughs> we work from home, yeah, often. Um, but now I think a lot of other businesses have seen this. I can't see them going back to other ways of working. We saw the head of Barclays saying, why would I bring you know thousands of people to an expensive building in the middle of London where I've got the same productivity from working from home? I can really slim that down. Um, a friend of mine, I checked that out with him, and he said, yeah, actually, we were spending quarter of a million pounds on an office for our people, and our productivity hasn't changed. They're all working from home, and you know we're meeting in service stations and things when we're because they're still you know on the road in their particular business. Why would we invest in that building? We just don't need it. If we need a room. We can hire a room in a golf club. Uh, and so I think that will be a change because the digital technology is there now to support that way of working. And then you still need physical meetups, but we'll meet in different locations. And we might see that, you know, I was reading about that, that resurgence, that need for social, maybe that's where the high street will go. And we've seen in Hong Kong, the new Harbor development being a cultural, physical, as well as a shopping area, billions being spent on that. And maybe that's, that's part of the the big change that will come. Uh, on the, the downside, we see a number of tech technology driven firms that are very leveraged, that have taken massive debt and 
you know, with this idea that we're going to make money in the future, I, with recession and things, I, I think those firms are going to really struggle, um, if not get shut down. This, oh, we'll pay you tomorrow. The financial pressures will probably collapse a lot of those never, never digital firms. Um, I'm also interested to see what's going to happen with 5G because that rollout's happening now. Um, it may not have the huge impact that we had hoped for. Um, maybe it will, but you know, do we need faster, faster, faster and mobile? We need a home. Uh, we'll see what happens with 5G. So that's yeah, uh, I'm but watching. I think 5G is not uh, just um, you know just a te te technological or business thinking. It's also the political thinking, right? Because like China. Uh, ultimately has to do it. I mean, they, they've been basically shut out from US last year, like all these scandals with, you know, Chinese technology. Um, and, you know, they, they just, they will go that way. We know that. So at least part of the world. Was, so I'm, I'm just wondering about this, you know, this, maybe there will be this interesting segmentation where in some parts of the world you will have 5G and others you will not have 5G. So it's, it will be, I think, very interesting uh, to observe what's going to happen, right, in, in that space. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it is just a bandwidth thing, really, 5G. Um, what I think underpins it is it goes back to the, the, the hub of all things, Data Swift type project, is the questions of privacy um, that are emerging during COVID, and we're seeing it around the tracing apps. Um, and the, the idea of centralized data that we see in China where they take all your data, and this is mass surveillance, where you can run algorithms and you can track everybody, you know where they are at all times. And um, we've seen, I, you know, I'm, I'm not that happy with the UK's approach, the NHSX apps, which is a centralized database. And they say, well, that's more convenient for us. And I'm like, well, I loved your piece, your behavioral science piece, because I was like, well, from a behavioral science perspective, that's not encouraging me mm. to engage with this app. That's a barrier. And one thing that the COVID crisis might do is raise people's acknowledgement of where their personal data is being held. And if your company, for instance, starts asking you for personal health data, then I think, no, I, you know, why would HR hold my health records? And that's why me holding it using systems like like hat personal data accounts where I hold it, I can give you just the result, healthy or not. That's all you need to know. It's like when you go in a pub, you don't need to know my name, my address, all those other things that you disclose on your your proof of age. All you need to know is over 18 or not. Mm -hmm. So it's the binaries can come in, healthy or not, COVID or not. And, and I think that's where, you know, good data scientists who really can make their mark in the world, providing privacy for the individual and not happily drifting into mass surveillance that we see in some countries. So you already just started to, to, to kind of touch on this, uh, and I want to go from COVID to a broader picture. Um, so if we think about uh, the future of digital transformation in the next five years, uh, what do you think are the... the most, uh, yeah, what, what would be the, 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 the hottest topics? What would be, uh, yeah, what's the future? Okay. Over the next five years, I, I, I can see that digital is just going to be more and more integrated into our lives. So, you know, for researchers who want to talk about digital, you know, cyber, socio materiality, that, that real integration. And, you know, some of your work, I know, on behavioral science, it suddenly becomes really important. How is it changing behavior? How is the digital artifacts and ways of working changing as, as digital is fully, fully integrated? And we won't have, you know, a non-digital world. I think we're there, almost there already, but it's getting more and more integrated. I was going to say invasive, but it, it, it's, it's integrated into our lives in every facet of it. So from my perspective, you know, we've got business models. How does that work? But there's a battle over privacy. There's more deeply a battle over trust. Who do you trust and why? And already we've seen, uh, you know, Google, Android, uh, Apple flexing their power over personal data, telling government, governments that they won't let them use their phone for tracing apps. And you're like, well... Why are two American companies dictating policy in certain countries? 
I'm actually almost happy with that because they are privacy preserving in what they're saying, but I'm still not happy that companies are starting to dictate companies shouldn't be taking the moral the ethical high ground that's problematic so there's great big research questions around moral ethics and underpinning all of this to me is is the what will be over the next five years increasingly important is the battle over truth and as we move to data ownership you know the world's controlled by data we're seeing it already in twitter the emerging um, discourse on deep fakes, on news, we're seeing it with what Trump's doing, we're seeing it in the British media, you know, very current at the moment is is like the, the Dominic Cameron story where he's gone back and changed what he said in the past on his own blog, but obviously GitHub picks it up and says, no, <laughs> you didn't say that, you went back and changed it. So that was a bit crude. Um, and, you know, people saying, oh, well, I didn't say that. Well, you did because we've got history. But as we move forward, people are starting to edit history. It's real 1984 stuff. So there will be a battle over what is true. And there's a question there for the data scientists, for the behavioral scientists, for the ethicists. And again, I think potentially a role there for blockchain, which is you know, potentially immutable. So how can we get, if you like, a reflection of truth held digitally that is difficult, if not impossible, to change? And how do we make sure that, you know, actors are unable to dot the history or even project, you know, untruth into the market? And we see that increasingly in the media at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and with blockchain, I think we have a lot of examples, right? There are people who basically deliberately uh, <laughs> distort markets and, you know, like especially if they can influence their, their influences of, of opinions. Um, yeah, one thing I kind of uh, I wanted to, lead, uh, to expand a little bit on uh, what you said about productivity, because you mentioned productivity. Um, and um, do you think that we will change the, the way in which we think about productivity in the next in the next five years? Because like one thing that uh, I notice about about myself is yeah, I mean it's all it all went digital, but we all became a lot more accessible, and um, uh, a, a lot of us spend a lot of time in meetings. Uh, but I'm not sure that uh, is productive, right? So so do you think that there will be some sort of different way in which we assess? productivity in the future um yes i would hope so and um, a, a good friend of mine professor don weber uh, of sheffield university is an expert on productivity and we've, we've talked about productivity and what it means quite a lot uh, and i you know his work i, I think is worth for those interested in productivity is worth looking into but productivity as driven by government is strange in that it will nearly always look for you to reduce the number of staff you have, to mechanize, to automate, and drive, you know, drive wages down. And that's really not what we want our government to sort of, you know, government's driven by the productivity measure, and yet I'm paying my taxes to the government and they're pushing measures that make me unemployed. Uh, unless you're, you know, happen to be in that little strata, that's weird. It's not useful. But also, I think it's fundamentally the measures wrong. If we if we look at more about value creation and entrepreneurship and creativity, and, and maybe make the productivity measures more longitudinal to split it down, we need to be much smarter about the way we measure productivity. Then we can make the country wealthier. You know make people want to come here, make people want to invest here. And that really is about, you know, sovereign wealth. And it's about helping people live useful and happy and well paid and, and con make, making their lives contribute to society, which is actually what I think we need to do. And digital should be able to unlock that. But the the absolute measure of productivity used at the moment is fundamentally flawed. It's not useful. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a very economics answer. <laughs> yes. um, so after after the economics answer, I want to put you a little bit on the spot here, but maybe you could uh, project your psych psychiatrist <laughs> in, the next, <laughs> in the next few minutes. And uh, yeah, so 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 essentially, I wanted to ask you about this. So that you know, um, well, I talk to a lot of companies. You probably talk to a lot of companies as well, and a lot of people are very anxious at the moment. Uh, so, for example, R and D budgets were cut as a result out of COVID. Uh, so there are a lot of um, things that are happening and uh, a lot of companies are worried about uncertainty. So are there any recipes or is there any advice that you could offer them uh, at this difficult time? So maybe maybe some like uh, uh, something that you you could recommend based on your research and business models. And I'm, I'm sure you have looked at, you know, risky and uncertain environments. Yeah, um, you know, I'm Old enough that I remember the last major financial crisis when they shut all research. Um, one of the things, you know, with a crisis is is it, there's a chance to do big things. Um, there's a chance to take that risk when, you know, opportunities are made available. It, when things are going bad, that's when you can you can make those big changes. So, you know, look at your business and say, well, I've always wanted to do that. That's what we should be doing. That's where I see the opportunity. So, you know, explore that, that issue of customer value again. How can we really create customer value now? What does it mean? So using that crisis as an opportunity to explore uh, what's out there. Um, I always, when I'm talking to business, they say, oh, our competitors. And I often think, you're talking often about very local competitors. And I think, well, are they really competitors? We're, we're quite bad at this in universities. Um, but actually, most of the time, we're collaborators. And you see in supply chains, are oh, they my competitors? And I'm like, well, but in that project, you work really closely with them. Oh, yeah, they're great guys. They've got all these good resources, and they really match with us. So if you take a, you know, a business strategy perspective, a resource perspective, and you look at the value you can co-create by combining the, their resources and your resources to create new offers, new exciting things that really matches market need and demand. Uh, then you can create, you know, those those new opportunities, those new entrepreneurial businesses, uh, and you know, large and small firms should be doing that now. Um, with regards R and D spend. Um, Firms that I've seen are successful in in times like this still, you know, don't stop spending on R and D. Um, take that advantage that if others are stopping that spend and you continue to invest in three to five years' time, you'll be so far ahead of them because they've missed that opportunity. Um, you can hire now. We've got all these great students who are, you know, I'm lucky as an academic. I get to work with young people who are uninhibited in their view of the world. You know, they have crazy ideas because they don't know that you can't do that. And we never, I never tell them you can't do that because I think, well, you know, maybe you can. And if you employ those good people who are smart, who are well-trained, they're coming out now, you can, you can do great things. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people will put hiring freezes on, they'll stop R&D spending, and actually you can take advantage, okay? You're not going to have to pay people a great deal because they're going to be hungry for jobs. You can see that. So you can do things cheaply. Please don't underpay people, but that's going to be an economic reality. So you can hire lots of people doing good, exciting things and exploit the opportunities. So you know, that's that's what I would say and do, and that's what I'm pushing for at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, another difficult question for you. Uh, I know it will be difficult for you to pick something uh, in particular, but can you tell us um, about maybe one example of uh, a project that you're currently working on and uh, that makes you particularly excite, excited? Uh, yeah, excited. So, what keeps you awake at night these days? Oh, oh do I have to? Oh. Okay, so. <laughs> One. Well, well, well you don't have to. You don't have to choose one. Like, yeah. just tell us, like, what what do you do now? Yeah. Well, the privacy law, you know, personal data, mass surveillance thing. That's that's been keeping me up at night because I've been doing hackathons and things, and we've developed ShareTrace.org, um, which is a 
a tracing app that's privacy preserving. I've just done a hackathon with the law, uh, the F FT and global hackathon challenge looking at how do we get back to work and, and do that with a privacy preserving way so we're not sharing our health data. The blockchain work is keeping me up with, we're looking at chocolate at the moment. So chocolate supply chains and all the, the modern slavery caught in that and how can we use blockchain to make it make chocolate more secure i don't you know i'm not a big chocolate eater but it's fascinating how you've got these global supply chains and big firms um and a real problem with modern slavery and abuse and we can use bio markers on beans and, and you know then you don't need to follow it all the time you can you can just pick it up oh it was farmed there oh here it is in the chocolate bar so those are the things and obviously the I've got another project on, we're trying to cure cancer. Um, we've made a micro factory for on the body. It's optimizing mean manufacturing systems using CAR T cell immunotherapy, um, which treats leukemia. And that's a, a factory on the body and it pumps it in, pumps it out. And um, I spent hours reading about that and trying to help that project go forward because that's saving people's lives. And often we don't get to do that. And um, that's not one thing, is it? No, it's not, but that's great. So I think uh, for, for people who are listening to this, it shows that, you know, you can get involved in a lot of cool things if you do digital transformation or artificial intelligence work, and especially if you work on business models, uh, because there are many people who do tech, uh, right? And uh, very few people who can do uh, actually business models for the, you know, for, for so I, I feel I feel that anyway, because uh, I see a lot of people working on technology and quite a lot of people working on ethics side, but not many people working on, you know, the business models underlying, like how do you know, how do we actually how do we actually deliver that to the customer? How do we actually think about the entire supply chain? How does data propagate through the supply chain? So that's not something that you hear a lot, <laughs> yeah, at, at the moment. So we're almost at the end of the uh, at the end of the interview, and this is a, a question that every single guest that I had complains about, but I still ask it. <laughs> so uh, and the question goes like this: So if you could recommend one book and one film. Um, uh, for, f no, yeah, for, for people who are listening to this podcast, what would your recommendations be? And yeah, in this case, you can only pick one of each. <laughs> uh, it doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't have to be digital transformation AI related. It's mm -hmm. just something that inspires you, that you like, that, that you know, that, that uh, um, you, you keep yeah. kind of coming back to. Yeah. One, two. Yeah. <laughs> it's in my mind i've got like carl rogers a way of being body language by lmps reckoning with risk by good gigarenza mm -hmm. but i think gadama's book philosophical hermeneutics mm -hmm. would be the one okay now hans gregor gadama wrote her philosophical hermeneutics and it's it's just insightful it makes you think about how you think and you know it's all about knowledge horizons how do you expand your knowledge horizons and it's really about recognizing that everybody approaches things with prejudice so you've prejudged and i think that's a really useful way because people think oh you know i don't have any prejudice and it's like well prejudgment is how you open a door <laughs> you've looked at the situation you go oh yeah i turn the handle and it opens if you didn't have that, you wouldn't be able to navigate the world. And yet we're very judgmental about other people's prejudices, but we must understand we, we live, that's how we live. But it, it's only through working closely with others that we expand our knowledge horizons, understand theirs, and we can challenge our own, and that's how we learn. And his work really starts to push into that sort of philosophical understanding. And I think it's useful to step back from the day job and start to take that sort of ontological epistemological view of the world because you know as an academic you need to step back and consider your knowledge horizon what do you know and who can you work with to expand what you know and you know the exciting thing about what we do is is learning more so yeah read philosophical hermeneutics yeah and like, uh, i also want to mention that uh, if you want to kind of dive into uh, more into philosophy and epistemology glenn has a, a, a fantastic youtube channel where these issues are discussed uh, among other things 
Um, on, you know, I know that you have a lot of different things that you discuss, but this is one of the themes um, and uh, definitely very interesting. And, uh, um, you know, I think if, if you want to kind of have a broader picture and understand how people learn, how people produce research, how people think about, you know, important questions, um, uh, it, you know, these videos are very useful. Well, I, I'm finding them very useful. So, so please do check out the YouTube channel. Uh, again, the link will be underneath this video. And film. <laughs> film. Well, you know, you know, I am a massive film fan. Um, I watch many films every week, and one film is almost impossible. I did, I did, I, I do have five. Okay. And, <laughs> okay, like, tell us, tell us five, and then uh, if you had to pick yeah. one of these five, that that is kind of because uh, like I watch a lot of film. Mm. A lot, crazy amount of film. And I, I, I also, sort of, you know, the high fidelity, what's the top five? And, I, you know, uh, Le Hen, the French film about hate and, and, and you know, friendship, um, I think it's wonderful. Brazil, which is the film by Terry Gilliam, that's a, it's Ages of Men. You've got um, Time Bandits, Brazil, and Baron von Munchausen, which is youth, middle age, and old age. And Brazil, I think, is just a wonderful film. It's, it's, it's so dark and yet so insightful. The Big Blue, Luc Besson, about male obsession. It's beautifully shot. The people are beautiful. It's just a wonderful, insightful film. Um, Knights of Kiberia by Fellini. Um, it's about hope. And Fellini's obviously a genius. And the last one is Casablanca, mm -hmm. um, which is i mean people go oh, casablanca but watch it it's just it's funny it's sad it's hopeful it's beautifully shot it's got a message it's got everything you know there's a reason it's a classic um so if you had to awesome. pick uh, pick one of these five that you would put at the top what would that be <laughs> i you know i'd probably watch le grand bleu the big blue version mm -hmm. long the mm -hmm. director's cut which i've got it's very long yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's got very self-indulgent, long sweeping shots and it, the film's got everything. Yeah, I, I remember so growing up in Ukraine that this was a film that you had to go to uh, like a night, uh, you know, like a night show. Uh, and it it was very long. It was like it was it was start at midnight, and it would be like yeah, you would be like four hours later, you would emerge from the movie theater. But it was worthwhile. So it was, it's a, yeah. it's an amazing film. So, Glenn, so thank you so much for doing this and for finding the time. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people will find this uh, very insightful. And we talked about a lot of different issues. Uh, thanks a lot for finding the time and for talking to me today. Thanks a lot. Uh it's a real pleasure, real pleasure. Thank you.